Uh, es un gran, gran placer para mí hablar con todos ustedes y eh, es el más importante evento por mí aquí en, en, en eh, México porque ustedes son los líderes del futuro del pueblo judío. Lamentablemente no voy a seguir en español porque mi español no es muy eh, rápido. Y si sí, eh, hablo español, nos sentamos aquí eh, antes, man, eh, mañana por la mañana. No. With your permission, I'll go on to English. English is okay or Hebreo? What do you prefer? Who wants English? Okay, so English. Doesn't do that. Now, I'm not sure that I know what I said in Spanish. So I want to make sure that you understand, and it's a great pleasure to speak to you. Uh, you know, the Jewish people is a special, a very special people. And uh, against all odds of history, we are still here, we are still prosperous, and only 70 years after the Holocaust, which was the most abominable uh, crime in history. And there is only one people that you can think of that came 60, 70 years from the ashes of the crematoriums to where we are today. Prosperous people back at our home, Zion, Jerusalem, speaking the same language of 4,000 years ago and living in the same land against all odds, against all pogroms. And this is why all of us, our generation, which is the generation of the Geula, the generation of the redemption, it is our responsibility to continue the Jewish tradition, the Jewish values, the Jewish uh, uh, future in the most, in the most uh, uh, exitoso, in the most excellent way. So you are the ones, and this is why it's a pleasure to be here. I thought in the beginning I would tell you a little bit of my own personal uh, experience. And uh, after I finished the military in Israel. I was a captain in the armored forces, in uh, tanks. I studied, and I did not study uh, international relations or politics. It was economy and MBA. But when I was in a campus in the United States, in Israel there is no problem. I uh, graduated from Tel Aviv University. But then I went to Ohio with my wife, and we studied there at the Ohio State uh, University. And there I encountered, for the first time, anti-Israel, which is anti judeo It was right after the uh, um, First War in Lebanon, 1982. Ancient history for you, I'm sure. But we were attacked by Arab students and also by American students who didn't know much better. And this is something that I wanted to give to you because you are going to graduate, I hope all of you, with great uh, so. grades. And you will go to uh, colleges here in Mexico, maybe other places in the world. And you must understand that today the Jewish people is facing an attack. An attack which is the new anti-Semitism of the past. In the new anti-Semitism of the past, they attacked Jewish people for what we were. Today, it's not the bon ton to be anti semisto so they transfer the attack against Israel. But attack against Israel is an attack against every Jew in the world, wherever it is. In the United States, in Russia, in France, in Israel, anywhere. And this is where we, today, all of us, must understand what we face. You see, the Jewish state, Israel, which we are all so honored to have, the most important thing for us, not just on the moral basis of history, it's the most important thing for us, for our future, and for the security. And there is this Arbut Hadadit, you know, wherever the Jewish people and the Jewish state goes, so does the entire Jewish people. And the state of Israel belongs to all of you. Whether you live in Mexico, 
or anywhere else. And this is the beauty of the Jewish people, because the Jewish state belongs to everyone. The Jews in Israel, of course, and we have the responsibility to defend it, to develop it economically, to make political decisions. And the Jews abroad, like in the diaspora, is to support, to advocate, to uh, support it politically against all the excitement, and of course to support when you will grow here in ISO, right? This is the, an insurance uh, policy that uh, we have, which is very, very uh, important. So this is something that we must all understand, because if the security and well-being of Israel is being compromised, so will be Jewish lives everywhere. And by the way, a very interesting point in history. You know, if you learn the history, there were many, many pogroms in Europe, in Russia, of course the Holocaust. In the Arab world, you know, there were many prosperous Jewish communities throughout the Arab world in the last 2,600 years. But there were also pogroms in the Arab world. I don't know if you have heard of the Farhud in 1941 in Baghdad against the Jewish community of Iraq. They were in uh, Alexandria, they were in Algeria, in Morocco, throughout. But when was the last pogrom in history? It was in 1946 in Kielce, a place in Poland, which is also amazing. A pogrom after the Holocaust, 1946. But this was the last one. Why are there no pogroms today? Because of the state of Israel. Since 1948, when the state of Israel was re-established, and it is very important, the terminology, the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, we were not established in 1948. We didn't come out of uh, nowhere. We were re-established. We, as a people, were established already 4,000 years ago. King David built Jerusalem 3,000 and 10 years ago. The temples and Jewish life throughout history were right there in our land, which is Zion, Zionismo, Jerusalem, and, and Israel. So this is very important to tell, without being apologetic, to anyone, especially the Palestinians, who come and try to erase Jewish history and tell us you should go. And uh, why aren't there any pogroms? Because they know that the Jews today are Arabim that Zelazé. No more we will go like the sacrificial lamb into massacres or into our death. Today we have the capability to defend ourselves by ourselves, and this is the most important thing. You know, two, about ten days ago, uh, Mr. Ariel Sharon, Prime Minister of Israel died. I want to tell you that Ariel Sharon, as a Prime Minister, always used to say, and he spoke to world leaders, first I am a Jew. And then I'm an Israeli. You have to understand that. First I am a Jew. And in one meeting, he had in 1998, he had a meeting with the Pope in the Vatican, John Paul II, you know, the Pope two popes uh, ago, they were sitting in the Vatican, we were discussing the history of uh, Christianity, of uh, Judaism, and other things, and the Pope said to Ariel Sharon, you know, there is a difference between Terra Santa, you know Terra Santa, Eretz HaKodesh, and Terra Promisa, Haaretz HaMuftacha. Eretz HaKodesh, Terra Santa, it is sacred and holy for all religions, for Muslims, for Christians, for Jews, but it was promised only to the Jews. And this is the main difference that we have. It was promised to the Jews and it is for us to keep and we don't have to explain to anyone. This is our place. Now, unfortunately, the Arabs, did not accept our being there, coming back to our homeland already a hundred and so years ago. Although it was not just a return, because as I mentioned to you, there was always Jewish presence in our land. 
and there was always a Jewish majority in Jerusalem, certainly until the 19th and 20th, beginning of the 20th century. Now, when Israel was recognized as a state, as a modern state, according to the UN, and by the way, the UN calls it a Jewish state, not just a state, a Jewish state, the Arabs didn't want it, so they attacked us. They attacked us with military force. We were in Israel in 1948, when we were re-established, only 660,000 Jews. We were surrounded by 100 million Arabs that attacked, and not only we survived, but we fight. And we are where we are today, with all the military attacks, today, and I'm not saying it lightly, today, Israel is the major military uh, force in the Middle East. Now, we shouldn't be complacent. You know, they say, we shouldn't be too bragging about it. We should work, so we will keep this edge, this comparative edge, all the time. But they couldn't take us militarily. When they didn't, when they saw that they couldn't take us militarily, they changed the tactic. They said, oh, we cannot kill the Jews on the battlefield, let's kill them economically. So there was a boycott. You know, Israel was the only country in the world that cannot buy and sell from their uh, neighbors. You know, here in Mexico, most of your trade and investments are with your neighbors. To the North, the United States, to the South, Latin America, this is how the natural thing is. Israel was isolated economically. What did we do? We had to excel, we had to compete with faraway markets in Europe, in the United States, in Latin America, in Asia. And today we have a very, very strong economy, an excellent economy, because we had to compete. So the Arabs saw that they cannot kill us economically, not militarily, not economically. So they changed again the tactic to terror. And there was this intifada. You heard the term intifada, this uh, Palestinian terrorism. And they tried to terrorize Israel. So the Jews in Israel will turn against the government, demanding security, and maybe stop and collapse the entire institution of the country. But the Jews in Israel were also very strong. And although we were attacked every day, the people kept going to work kept sending their kids to school, kept going to the markets, to the movie house, and that showed resilience against terrorism, and that gave time for the government to find a way to combat anti-terror uh, tactics, and it worked. By the way, the fence, have you heard of the fence that we have in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria? By building a fence, I know fences are not very uh, popular in Mexico, but sometimes fences have to be there to save lives. In any case, the terrorism also didn't put us down. So the tactics of military maneuvers didn't work, of economic boycott didn't work, of uh, terrorism didn't work. So now, this day and age, there is a new tactic of, by the Palestinians and by the Arabs and by the Muslims and by the, the modern anti-Semitism. Where is the battlefield today? The battlefield today is a virtual battlefield. It's something that you all participate in. The battlefield today is in the social media, is in the Facebook, it's in the internet, it's in the Twitter, it is in the uh, YouTube. And what they are trying to do is to delegitimize Israel. Is they are trying to make the world isolate Israel. And they keep repeating lies about Israel, about how we treat the Palestinians, about who we are, about what we do. And you will hear it in the media, you will hear it in the social media, that Israel is a bad country. Now, are we a bad country? Did we take the land from anyone else? No, if you read the history, you will see that never ever there was any sovereign over Israel, which is, was called Palestine throughout the years, other than the Jewish people. Yes, there were many occupiers, the Greeks and the Romans and the Mamelukes and the Ottomans 
the Turkish Empire and the British Mandate, but they were all occupiers. The only people who were sovereign over Jerusalem and the land was Israel. So now the Palestinians are trying to say, no, we are the original people. The Jews just came from all over and took our land. All you have to do, if you hear this in the colleges next year, tell them, read your history. And the land is called Israel. And it's called Judea. And it is called Zion. These are not only biblical names, these are historical names. When did the name Palestine come for the first time? Anybody knows? You know, Palestine, Palestina, is not even an Arab name. It's a Roman, it's a Latin name that was given to the land by Adrian uh, Caesar in uh, 135 AD, 135 years after zero year. And why was it given? Because he wanted to disconnect the time oh, yeah. between the Jews and their land. So instead of Israel, he said, we will now call it Palestina. And since the Romans were the ones who were charting all the maps, so the map stayed with Palestina. By the way, the same Roman emperor tried to also change the name of Jerusalem. And he said, no more Jerusalem, we will call it Ilia Capitolina. But that didn't stick. Jerusalem was too powerful not to be changed. But the name of Israel was turned into Palestina. And ever since, they were, as I said, occupiers until the British mandate, about uh, 70, 65 years ago. So the name Palestina is a Roman name, and the people who are called Palestinians were the Jews and the Arabs who were living there. And when the UN decided to partition the land for Jews and the Arabs, the Jews accepted, the Arabs didn't, and the war started, as I told you, when we were there attacking. So first and foremost, you have to understand that we did not take the land from anyone, it is ours. If anything, the Arabs and others who came to the land to work with us because we were uh, establishing a new economy, there was employment, so Arabs came from all over, and they are the immigrants to, to, to the land. So this is number one. Secondly, they will try to tell you that Israel is like an apartheid uh, country, that we do not treat the Palestinians well, not in the West Bank, not in Gaza, and for this, there is a very, very simple answer. We wanted peace. We were ready. The Jewish people is the only people in the world that is willing to give up historical land for peace. We gave Gaza. You know, in 2005, Ariel Sharon, the Prime Minister, gave Gaza to the Palestinians. And he evacuated 21 Jewish communities that were in Gaza. Three generations of people had to uproot and go, only for peace. The Palestinians took Gaza, and what happened? They are still trying to kill us from Gaza. So, we have to understand that the conflict with the Palestinians is not territorial. Had it been territorial, they would have accepted all our offers. We were offering them to partition the land back in 48. We are offering them now. Yes, even Mr. Bibi Netanyahu, our Prime Minister, says, I am willing to give you a state. And it will be the irony of history that for the first time the Palestinians will get a state by the Jews. The Arabs didn't help them, the international community didn't help them. We are ready to give them a state. But there are two conditions. If we give them a state, they have to sign and promise not to attack us. Number one. And secondly, they have to say, we recognize you, your rights to be here as a Jewish state, and we promise to end the conflict. Because we don't want to give them the state, and then when they have the state, they will say, okay, now we want the rest of the country. Now we want Tel Aviv, now we want Haifa, now we want Jaffa, now we want Eilat and all that. They have to sign that if we give them a state, this is the end of the conflict. They are not ready to do it. And they are also not ready to ensure us that there will not be uh, terror, like from Gaza and still 
from the West Bank or Judea and Samaria. Now, I told you about our capability for self-defense. There are some in the international community or even the Palestinians and they say, no, 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 we will not guarantee that we will not attack you with peace, but there is the United Nations, there is peacekeeping forces, we will bring, there is maybe NATO, we will bring the international forces and they will be as a buffer on the new border between Israel and the new state of Palestine. And we, as Jews and Israelis, we know better. We say we cannot let anybody defend ourselves but ourselves. No more, never will we rely on somebody else to protect us. First of all, we had very bad experience for the last 2,000 years. When we were defenseless, when there wasn't a Jewish army, they killed us, the pogroms, and of course the Holocaust. But it's not just against the Jewish people. In that respect, we are not unique. Look today what happens to people that cannot defend themselves. If you may not remember, but about 10, 15 years ago, in Africa, in Rwanda, one and a half million people in Rwanda were killed because they, didn't, they couldn't defend themselves. In Darfur, Sudan, 300,000 were killed just in the last few years because they didn't have the means to defend themselves. In Europe, in Bosnia, there were people who were killed. There is this massacre of Kilze. 8,000 people in Bosnia were murdered only a few meters away from NATO forces that were there. And what is happening in Syria today? Are you following the news in Syria? In Syria, already 130, more probably, thousand people were killed because the Syrian people cannot defend themselves against the Iranian, the terrorist, Hezbollah, and the Assad regime and terrorists. So people who cannot defend themselves and rely on somebody else in the international community cannot be safe. The international community, unfortunately, is not capable. If they do something, it's always too late or too little. So this is why when people tell us, well, don't worry, give the land to the Palestinians and we will bring peacekeeping troops, we say, no way. Nobody will defend us as we are. So if the Palestinians do not agree to all this, and if they continue their terror and their incitement, how can we give them land? And we are willing to do that. Again, it's the only country that can do it. I want to tell you another story to show you how other countries and peoples in the world behave. Again, I'll tell you a story from Ariel Sharon. When he was the Prime Minister for the first time in 2001, we went together to the Kremlin, you know, to the... Putin was the president, the first time he was president, now he's for the second time president. Putin was the president and uh, he sat with Sharon and Putin kept putting the pressure on Sharon. Why don't you give the Palestinians the land? Give the Palestinians the land, then there will be peace. I want peace, we need peace. If you don't give them peace, it's instability. Give them the land. Sharon got tired of this push and he said, Mr. Putin, see this? Israel is a very small country. The land is ours. So if we give the land, we will be even smaller and even more weak and vulnerable. But you, Russia, you are such a big land, a huge land, and you occupy a small island, it's called the Kurili Island, in the North Pacific Sea, that you conquered from Japan after World War II. Why don't you, Russia, give this small island back to the Japanese? So Putin looked at him and says, give back land? Russia? Never. How do you think Russia became so big? We never give land to anyone. So Sharon told him, well, what's good for Russia is also good for the Jews. And he never heard Sharon, uh, Putin asking him to give land. There are so many territorial disputes in the world. For instance, Turkey. Turkey occupies North Cyprus. And Turkey is building settlements in North Cyprus. Do you hear any condemnations against uh, Turkey? Do you hear any boycotts? Any sanctions? Any con Nothing. 
Russia occupies Abkhazia, part of Georgia. Do you hear any condemnations of occupation, of settlement? Kashmir, which is also a dispute between the India and Pakistan, do you hear that? Nothing. And I can assure you, at any given time, there are 40 to 50 political and territorial disputes between countries all over the world. Do you hear about it? No. Only about the Palestinian, only about Israeli occupation, and the attack is on Israel because there is a whole campaign to delegitimize Israel, to attack us politically and mainly on the social media. So we have to counter it. How do we do it? Very easily by going back to the basics and talking about the history. As we mentioned, about Jewish rights, justice for the Jews, and also, also about comparison with others. If people come to you and say Israel is, is occupying, the answer is very easy. Why are we occupying the West Bank? Because they attacked us. We are willing to give some of it to the Palestinians if they will recognize us, if they will give us peace, but they do not. There shouldn't be pressure on Israel because it's double standard. There is no pressure on Turkey against uh, Cyprus or uh, Russia against uh, uh, Georgia and so on and so forth. So by just putting the truth in, in front of people, it changes the debate. We have a problem. We are a small people. There is only one Jewish state. There are 22 Arab countries. And this is before what is called the Arab Spring is over. I believe that the continuation of the problems in the Arab world, with the disintegration of the Arab world, in 10 years we will have more than 22 Arab countries, because Syria will be split, Lebanon, Iraq is already de facto split, and more problems. We don't have time to discuss it, but if you have a lesson about the landscape of the Middle East, it's quite interesting. But we are outnumbered, as I mentioned today, 22 Arab countries. These 22 Arab countries are a group within a larger Muslim group of 57 Muslim countries. It's called the OIC, Organization of Islamic Countries. So you have already 57 against one Jewish state. And yet, these 57 are part of what is called the non-aligned group, or developing country group in the United Nations, which is 118 countries. Total number of the UN. You know how many member states are in the United Nations? Any guess? 50, 100, 150, how many? 200. Close. 193 countries, member states. Out of the 193, 118, as I told you, the Arab League, Organization of Islamic States, and the Non-Aligned, which they need them for oil, 118 is a total majority. Any decision, any resolution that the Palestinians bring to the UN is accepted. Abba Ibn, a legendary uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Israel, in the beginning of the state, said that if the UN or if the Palestinians came with a resolution that the uh, sun revolves uh, around the earth and the earth is flat, it will get uh, accepted, the automatic majority. So when people tell you, well, but the UN is against you, you said, well, the UN is corrupt. The UN is a rubber stamp for the Palestinians because of this uh, automatic majority. And this is why negotiations with the Palestinians cannot be in the UN. It can be only direct, direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians, no uh, uh, preconditions. Since we have the problem of the Hasbara, of the political warfare, and especially it's in the, uh, in the social media, I decided when I left the government, at least for a while, to start an organization which is called The Truth About Israel. And I would like all of you to, if it's possible, to memorize, and I will also give it to the directors, the website, because there you have all the facts in a very, very short way that gives answers to all the attacks on Israel. All the attacks on Israel. 
So the truth, the truth about Israel.org, .il, if you uh, also want to learn, you can go into my Facebook. You are, you are in Face. I am also in Face, and you can see there all the YouTubes and short videos which explains all the complex issues in very, very easy terms. So you can explain it, you can pass it to other friends, and when you meet new friends in colleges and universities next year, many of them maybe will not be uh, Jewish, uh, they will hear bombardment of the Palestinians because they have the quantity, you will have answers. And I can tell you, that even if the Palestinians continue the lies every day, a lie remains a lie. And the truth has to be spoke, spoken without any fear. If you are even one against the hundred, you tell the truth, and decent people will start changing their mind. It's not going to be easy, but it's very necessary to do. So this is where we are today. The battlefield is virtual battlefield on face, uh, the internet, in the campuses, in the media. Last thing I want to say is about the future. Since you are the new leaders, the future leaders of the Jewish people. And as I mentioned, we have the best gift of Jewish history in the last 2,000 years. And this is the most important thing to keep. Jewish continuity through Jewish solidarity all over the world, through Jewish identity and through Jewish education. And this is why I am so appreciative and thank you, all of you here, Marcus and all of you here, for what you do in this Monte Sinai, Sinai uh, uh, school. This is really a center of excellence and we need more centers like this all over the world, in Jewish communities all over. In Israel, I don't have to worry about it. Because, you know, the mitzvah, the deed of settling the land, is done by the Jewish Israelis. But in the diaspora, the most important thing is to keep the Jewish continuity, and you do it with Jewish identity and pride. Because when you go to your life, of course it's very important to get a good job, it's very important to get an interesting uh, career, it's also very important, you know, to have a good time and sports and leisure and have good friends. But is this enough? If this is why we were put here on earth, there is something which is more than that. There is something of a higher calling. To be a complete person, you have to be very, very proud of your identity, of who you are. And as Jews, we should be always very proud of what we have survived, but mostly of what we will achieve in the future. And all of us together will achieve a great future for the Jewish state, Israel, and for Jewish people all over the world. I want to thank you very much for coming. And please remember, please remember. que ya tenemos a Dani acá con nosotros para ver si es que quieren hacer algunas preguntas las pueden hacer en castellano Dani es bien de español pero supongo que contestará en inglés eh, así que si es que hay alguien que quiera hacer alguna pregunta por favor eh, es el momento no todos al mismo tiempo por favor Bueno, si todos entendieron todo. Entonces, muchos éxitos en el futuro, en los exámenes. Que si puede explicar un poco más sobre la primavera en los países árabes 
y qué es lo que podemos esperar de esa situación. Thank you. The Mahapohot, right? The revolutions in the world, in the Arab world, actually are going back to the history, to the steady state. You see, all the Arab countries, all the Arab countries except Egypt, are artificial countries. They were all different tribes, different religions, different uh, uh, Muslim sects. They are Sunni, they are Shiite, they are uh, different ethnic groups and tribes. And they were living there in the Middle East. When the British and the French came after World War I, they decided to make new countries and it was regardless of the demography of the people. So when they had dictators, all the problems, all the conflicts between Shia and Sunni and tribes were pushed under the rug because there was a big strong dictator. But when the dictators are gone, whether it's Mubarak in uh, Egypt, or whether it's Gaddafi in Libya, or whether it's Saddam Hussein in Iraq, or now Assad is weakening in, uh, in, uh, in Syria, you see all the problems come out. All the problems come out. Shi'i against Sunnah, tribes against each other. Even within Sunnah and within the uh, Shi'i, there are different sects, Alevites, Alawites, and, and others. So, actually, what we're going to see is a breakup to more homogeneous units. And this is the new trend. Internationally, there is a mega trend of nation states breaking up to the more homogeneous. Uh, countries like the Soviet Union broke up with the 15 republics, Yugoslavia was broken up with the 16 countries, um, Sudan, South Sudan, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, and we're going to see this also in the Middle East for the next, but it will take a long time. So we're going to see a breaking of the Middle East, not to nation states, but to ethnics, religion, and um, um, tribal elements. For instance, Iraq already is split. There is a Kurdish area in Iraq, Sunni and, and Shia. So this will be the continuation. Is it good for Israel? I think so. Because they're going to be more separated and more split. So from a strategic point of view, it's good for Israel because they're going to be very weak, smaller, and turning against each other. But tactically, the danger is if there is no central strong uh, government, then there is an element of radicalization and of terrorism. So terrorism can come up from the Sinai or from Syria without central control. So Israel has to gear up against terrorism on its borders. This is why we finished our fence in the south, in the Sinai, against infiltration from, uh, from uh, the Egypt side. And we are doing the same thing now on the Golan Heights against uh, Syria. Thank you.